Okay, I think we are live. I believe we are. I don't see anything that tells me we're live, but I think we are. I, I see it, Gloria. I see it on Do the Do you see it? Floor. Okay, I see it. Okay, all right. Okay, I'm not seeing it, but everybody else is, so I'm believing it. We are so live today. We are so live with this incredible opportunity to talk to Lily Ledbetter and Cindy Guerra Robbins. I am telling you, I want to welcome you to intentioning this live series today. It's a series of conversations with you to help you reach your highest intentions. I'm Gloria Felt. I'm co-founder and president of Take the Lead. And our mission is nothing less than gender parity in leadership by 2025. And that means equal pay, equal power, equal positions. And so I am super excited to introduce two absolute sheroes of the movement for equal pay. And I want to thank each of you right now up front before we even start talking for the work you have done, which is actually benefiting every single one of us, uh, every woman who is who's watching today. And I hope we have a lot of folks joining us today. So let me give you a quick intro of the two of you, and then we will just launch into some questions and, and hear your stories and I'm sure you have so much advice you can give also along the way to women who also are trying to get equal pay and equal positions for themselves. So we have Lily Ledbetter, who has become a household name with her historic high profile lawsuit against Goodyear Tire and Rubber, which was filed after she had exhausted other remedies for the blatant pay discrimination she discovered after she had been working for the company for decades. Not to be deterred by after the Supreme Court overturned her previous victories, she turned to legislative remedies. So we will talk about all of those. Cindy Guerra Robbins made history in a different, very strategic way that she took the initiative to shape corporate policy in order to secure pay equity. And it's a story that I actually share in my book, Intentioning, because of its lessons in the importance of relationships and how you do movement building, whether you are in an organization, whether you are doing it in the public square, the principles are still the same. So let's just jump right in. Cindy, would you just start telling us a little bit about your background and how did you happen to take on that initiative to equalize pay at Salesforce? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. And um, I just want to say thank you again to Lily Ledbetter. We should all be thanking her for paving the way and being the trailblazer that she has been for, for all of us. Um, and, um, you know, it really started with a conversation between myself and Leila Seca, who's a very good friend of mine, and she was a product executive at Salesforce. Um, and we had both been promoted about the same time and both been elevated into big jobs. And I think, you know, after we uh, came down from the euphoria of being promoted and in big jobs, we knew we had a different level of responsibility. We had power in the company, uh, given our level, our role, who we reported to. I reported to the CEO. She reported to um someone on the management team in a leadership role. And we both put our heads together because we knew that we needed to do more for women inside the company. Um, we wanted to see women elevated inside the company, more women in positions of power, being given equal opportunity to those positions. And we also discussed pay. You know, I think in our roles at the time, we talked to a lot of different women who just wanted a sounding board to talk to us, not as a head of HR, a product executive, but just as two women who were suddenly in positions of power mm -hmm. and they were seeking advice and counsel, you know, and you just started to hear common themes, common questions, concerns, and we knew that pay was something that Layla and I felt had a gut reaction that it's something, regardless of whether there's a problem or there's a comp, it, it should be part of the company philosophy. It should be part of our value system. Um, and so we took it to the CEO and we didn't take it as a HR message or a product executive message. We took it as two women uh, who wanted to have a conversation with the CEO 
and talk about something um, and educate as well that we felt that there might be a problem inside the company. We hadn't done an assessment yet, but we wanted his buy-in. It all starts at the top. You know, Layla and I could not have done that without Mark Benioff's support and advocacy. Um, and we're thankful that he said yes, but I had a partner. So I know that there are a lot of women who want ways to do this, but you know, I know that it can be quite uh, concerning to try to do it alone. We had each other. Lily did it alone. Lily had the great courage. You know, she did it alone. So we took it to him. It became, in short, it became part of the, the company value system. I'm so happy that they continue to do that audit every single year um, because it's an evolution. It's a, it's a, it's a journey. You're, you're not going to have, you're not going to have a company that says they have flawless processes and uh, systems. You're always going to have things that might impact people's pay and you have to look at it every single year. And so I'm happy that they continue to do that. Wow. So that, that that's a good moment to ask Lily then, because uh, Cindy, you said Lily did it alone, whereas you had you had your colleagues. And I, I, I do want to point out that one of the leadership tools that we teach all the time at Take the Lead is called Create a Movement. And mm -hmm. to do that, you have to first find the other people who share your values and your concerns. And you yes. have to get together with them and have the courage to put those issues on the table. And then you go to where the power is and, and do what you can to make the change. But you're right. So that's a good segue to you, Lily. Now, you had worked at Goodyear for many years, right? And you had I a had. leadership position, right? I did. Yes, I hired in as a manager. When I went to work, I went in as a manager in production. <clears throat> yes, I did. And how... How did you find out? So I just want to say I can sympathize with you for not knowing sooner that you were underpaid compared to your male colleagues, because I, too, never questioned such things when I was younger. I think there may be a generational thing here. I'm not sure. But I was just glad to be doing a job I loved. So how did you realize that you were being paid less and what made you take action on it? Well, it was an anonymous tipster gave me an anonymous note just mm. on a torn piece of paper. And I still today do not have an idea who who gave me that note and that information wow. because when I went to work with Goodyear and went through the HR department, fill out all my paperwork with holdings and insurance and so forth, they told me you never discuss your pay if you work here because if you do, you will lose your job. So they never discussed pay. We never knew the union people pay everybody knew what everybody made because it was negotiated through the union but the management people did not have a union so i never knew i didn't even know when raises came out they never posted them they never said they'll be three percent this year or five percent or seven percent never you didn't have a clue how much you might get and they only gave them out to me about every year and a half to two years and um, but the other people I found out during the um, trial, during the discovery, that they were getting pay, getting a raise every year, and they were nice, very very big. That's where the money went was to the men. So I was getting mm -hmm. left out, and it was simply because I was a female. I did my job. I did a great job, um, and they didn't evaluate us except I was there for almost 20 years. And I was evaluated three times in that 20 years. And that was when they were having a salaried cutback. And that was so they could stack people to get rid of the ones they wanted to and to keep the people they wanted mm. to. Um, mm. But that was the way it was. So I never had a way to know. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got this raspy voice today. And then the other problem was when I went to work, Goodyear was making airplane tires for the military planes and the government planes. And they were making Jeep tires for the Jeeps and the military. And then when I left 20 years later, they were making, still making Hummer tires. They still had government contracts, but they were mm. not getting audited or getting checked in order to get those contracts. There was no requirement. They just whoever jockeyed enough in the lobby case 
got the contracts. So, so you let's let's kind of go back to you get this anonymous tip. What do right. you do? What what did you do when you got that anonymous tip? What was the next thing you did? Well, when I saw it, <clears throat> it was my pay, my base pay, and three men. We four had the same job. And what hit me first was the difference in our pay. And then the next thing was my overtime because, like, for example, my peer had a heart attack. I worked two months straight, seven mm -hmm. nights a week, 12-hour shifts, seven nights a week for two months. And uh, that's a lot of overtime, time and half, double and triple. And that hurt me a great deal, and I was just devastated. But then later in the shift, I thought about, hey, my retirement's based on this, my contributory mm -hmm. retirement about 401k and my social security all mm -hmm. will be based on what I'm earning. And I just, I just couldn't let that go. So I told my husband the next morning, I said, I must get to Birmingham, Alabama and file a charge with the Equal Employment Opportunity Center unless you object. And I will warn you, if I start, it will take at least eight years. It took nine years. From the time I mm -hmm. filed the first charge, it was nine years later before I got the final verdict and I never got a penny. I won 3.8 million in the first trial in the federal court and Goodyear appeal. It went to 11th circuit. They disallowed it. We appealed, went to the Supreme Court in November of 2006. The verdict came out in May of 07. And that was nine years later, nine years later. And they disallowed it five to four. <clears throat> but they've closed the courtroom doors with that verdict. Those five justices on the Supreme Court, they shut the courtroom doors. No one else could have ever benefited from equal pay law and filing a charge for the equal pay because it would have been so short. Wow. Because so so, mm -hmm. so if, we, if we go back then to, I'm curious, Cindy, when did you first hear about Lily and and her her work and her lawsuit? What what recollections do you have about? Did, was that what inspired you, or 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 what was it? There were, I mean, Layla and I talked about this a lot, and and we had different sources of inspiration. Lily, we met that first year we started the discussion. Um, we went to the White House and Obama was in the president, um, was our president, and we were celebrating the Lilly Ledbetter Act. And that was the first time I met her. Um, and it was just so surreal being even there and being recognized, Salesforce being recognized for the work that we were doing, uh, Mark being recognized as a CEO. Pause. I think that was just a that was a big aha moment, I think, for us that, you know, I think Layla and I turned to each other and just like, what did we do exactly? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're like sitting in like the West Wing of the White House. <laughs> so we're watching, you know, Obama and Lily and it, it was just kind of surreal. Um, I think too, like there were a lot of things that happened that year too. Uh, Patricia Arquette, her, her Oscar speech, uh, mm -hmm. where she talked about equal pay. Um, it, you know, these are just some things that just resonated with Layla that, okay, you know, we're doing the right thing, right? There are lots of amazing trailblazers like Lily and, and, and now like the U S women's soccer team and what they've accomplished. Um, and I hope it just continues because it gives a level of confidence. I think it gave a level of confidence to Layla and I that what we were doing was the right thing and that it wasn't just a one conversation with the CEO that we needed to go do the work, continue to be advocates for this, um, get more men in the company mm -hmm. talking about this, speaking about that, trying to understand what it means to have more women in leadership roles, how you recognize and reward those women. Um, and just taking a, a look around, you come into a meeting and take a look around the table and are there any women sitting at that table? You know, that's it. it mm -hmm. Equal pay is it spans more than just compensation. It's also just about equality in general, equal opportunity, equal access. And, um, you know, like I said, I think this is a journey. Um, but it's just about companies trying to do the right thing. 
Well, so uh, I, you mentioned, Cindy, you, you mentioned that signing of the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. And I, Lilly, there was that, it was an incredibly iconic moment. I, and I can just see it. I can just see it right now in my mind's eye when you stood beside President Obama as he signed the, the legislation that was named for you into yes. law. What was that like? What was that like for you? That was unreal. That was really an unreal moment. And uh, you see, I had just lost my husband two weeks earlier, mm -hmm. but bless his heart at that moment in time, I mean, everything I focused on that day was that signature. Every time he'd make a mark and change pens, I thought, yes, that's somebody's equal pay right there. If somebody will get the right treatment, they'll have a good retirement and they can live a good life. They can send their kids to college and buy a house and pay the mortgage and have a good retirement. That's exactly what was going through my mind. And you know, there were Republicans and Democrats standing there <clears throat> that day. And I've had a lot of questions about why I wore the red jacket. I wore the red jacket because women were still in the red. <laughs> it, had a, it had a meaning. I didn't just get a red jacket and put it on. And I had the pin on with a woman that was campaigning. She was carrying a red purse. And then the other hand, they didn't put a hand or anything. They just chopped her little arm off. So I put an equal pay button on my jacket there. That was a lot of discussion online then was where did I get the pin and what did it mean? But just a few people realized that red jacket meant something too. <clears throat> I don't think well, many people I, I, know the story. I think that's, I mean, I just recently, the last year, I think heard that story. And it was, uh, think, you know, we were so short of money and so far behind. And uh, I loved that day at the White House when I met Cindy and Mark and the other lady uh, because that story and Cindy knows I talk about Salesforce everywhere I go because <laughs> I have to have these companies and I have these states that I use. I, I would like to move to Delaware or New Jersey because I could get equal pay and they would make sure I did uh, in those <laughs> states. New Mexico would. But um, and I always talk about Salesforce because I don't have that many companies that I will mention in the open. But that mm -hmm. and uh, ITT up in uh, New York is another good company. They go to high so, school even and recruit. That, that, that's great. You know, I did not know the red jacket story until just now. But you see, I'm wearing a red jacket because <laughs> that picture is just like right. it's seared into my soul. I also I usually wear red jackets, <laughs> but that's a whole other story. I, yeah. I do it for I do it for another reason. I, I have a fetish about wearing the color that whatever my last book is. Uh, I wear the colors of that book cover, and that's just kind of weird. But it's definitely not as profound as getting a law sign to give people equal pay. So, <laughs> well, that was, but I am that was a day in my life, and uh, you know the women who went that day for that bill signing, Gloria, you might have known this. That was the first day that the women in Washington D.C. or around any other circumstances had been in that white house in eight years oh eight wow years. of course of course eight yes mm-hmm mm-hmm mm -hmm. yeah That's yeah why I, yeah. I, I didn't know if they were excited because i was there and was getting a new bill <laughs> or because they got to come to the white house it was so <laughs> uh, you know what a difference an election makes i'm just going to yeah. leave it at that but everybody yeah. needs to understand what a difference an election makes and it is really 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 true and actually as we as we are now in another election year, it seems like almost every year, in fact it is, every other year is an election year. But the truth is that I think often people don't realize how so many of these issues do fit together and right. that equal pay, equal pay, the equal rights amendment, uh, reproductive rights, voting rights, all of these issues really are the fundamentals of democracy. And so I think people tend to see them in silos as individual issues, but really, when women can have equal pay, it does all those things you mentioned, Lily. It gives it gives us a retirement. It gives us an ability to feed our families. It gives us all of those things. I mean, people just tend to think of it as being some side issue, but it's not. It is very, very fundamental to our ability to be full and complete citizens. So I want to go back to the corporate, um, you know, we, because I think oftentimes many women feel like, well, 
I can't get a law passed. I'm not going to file a lawsuit. Uh, I don't know if I have the ability to get anything done by myself. So I do want to ultimately get to what individual women can do for themselves. But I thought it would be good, Cindy, if you could talk about things that women can do inside their organizations to bring equal pay issues to the attention of people who need to, or who the, are the decision makers who can actually make a change. I mean, what what can women do on their own to, to help make change in their organizations? Well, you know, I think if you're, it, it does differ, differentiate probably a little bit if you're, for example, an individual contributor versus if you are in a management role or in a leadership role. I think if if you're a woman in a leadership role or in a management role and you have a team, um, I think you you do what you can to set the example, right? And asking the right questions and uh, working with HR and ensuring that the policies that are being uh, rolled out across the company, whether they're promotional pro- policies or hiring proce- processes, that they're done in an equitable and fair way. I think when you're an individual contributor, um, you have to find a path. And I think even for Layla and I, when we started having this conversation, we did reach out to a few people, mostly men in positions of power to talk about this, that we were thinking of going to mark in this uh, with this subject. What did they think? Uh, did they think, you know, we were on the right path? Did they think we should not do it at all and why? Um, so it was a really interesting kind of discovery journey that we went on to get people's senses. And what I think we realized is just a lot of people didn't understand equal pay um, and didn't understand why we would raise this as an issue. Um, and I think mm-hmm. you, you just have to start to ask yourself some questions. And I think it goes to sitting down with your manager. That's the first part. Asking questions about how you're evaluated, how it affects your compensation, um, how they view their, what is their compensation philosophy. You have to put some level of trust in those conversations. And uh, if not, then you have to figure out a way to elevate those conversations. But I know it can be quite um, well, it was for Layla and I, it was daunting. You know, it was, we questioned it a lot. We didn't know, you know, was this the right time? Was it, you know, was it the right, uh, topic to, to raise at the time? Did we have all our ducks in a row, right. To really, um, share this concern with the CEO. And I think you have to do your homework. You have to do your homework. Um, Mm -hmm. so there's a, a lot, I will say, Getting advocates and champions along the way are really, really key, especially if you're kind of, you think you're going it alone, you have a gut concern, you are you got a tip, like Lily got her tip, you got a tip that maybe you're being underpaid, is trying to figure out who are the advocates and champions that you can turn mm-hmm. to, to address the situation, right? Mm-hmm. And I, mm-hmm. I, I think for Layla and I too, one thing we we did a lot of um, is talk to a lot of men after Mark said, go do it because we wanted to make sure it wasn't something that was going to be forced on people that we made a problem for people inside the company that we were trying to educate, like, this is the right thing to do. And this is why, and this is core to the company's values and who we are as a company. And I think there's just a lot of education that has to go on. Well, and and speaking of education, in my observation, and I was observing not as somebody who really knew anything. I didn't know you at the time. I didn't know that much about Salesforce. But as I was observing what was happening, once Salesforce had taken that step and had done it in a public way, what I saw was a a lot of other companies started having that same conversation Mm -hmm. and making some of those kinds of shifts. So it's, you know, one of the things I always say to people is is what you do is more than what you do. And this was definitely a case of what what you did was more than what you did. And what Salesforce did was more than what even that one company did, even it's a huge company, but still Mm -hmm. the reverberations were way beyond. Uh, Did you, am I correct about that? And what are, what are your observations? 
Yes. I mean, I think there were a lot of companies that came out and talked about that they they were doing things. There was a lot of sharing of how companies were, were doing the assessment. Um, so those were all good dialogues to have inside the company because every company is going to have their own kind of compensation philosophy or how they uh, how they evaluate performance of an individual and how it affects their income, for example. Um, so it was there was a lot of good that came and a lot of actually education that I didn't know of certain companies that had already done this type of assessment. Hmm. Um, I think, you know, I think Mark talked about this a little bit. Um, I think he got a few calls from some of his friends um, at different companies that probably would prefer he didn't be so vocal on the subject because it puts pressure, right? It puts pressure on these companies to to do their own assessments. And I think I think he recently even stated this um, that you know people are afraid it's going to be a big number that they're going to have to fix a big problem and they're not going to have necessarily the money to do it. They're not going to prioritize it, et cetera, et cetera. But listen, I think even when, when I told him, look, I haven't looked under the hood. I don't know. I don't, I did not do a secret assessment. I don't have a number to tell you right now, but what I can tell you is we can't go do this assessment, look under the hood, see a big dollar sign and shut it and walk right. away. That we cannot right. do, right. Right. but doesn't mean you need to fix it all in one year, right? You know, the company still needs to perform. I mean, there's lots of factors, but if you show that you're making progress to doing the right thing and the right steps to do uh, equal pay, maybe it takes a year, maybe it takes two years, maybe it takes every single year, which it does, mm -hmm. right? When you're doing this type of audit. So, right. I think it had really, it, it sparked a lot of good discussion amongst peer, uh, our peers. And then it, it did, I'm sure it sparked a little like, uh, you know, concern. I'm sure Mark took a few calls. That were like, yeah, really? well, nobody, nobody wants to say that their company is for unequal pay. That's for right. sure. Exactly. No, nobody, wants, <laughs> nobody wants to do that. So there's so many incredible stories here. And Lily, I, I know that there is a film being made right now about you and your story and the whole uh, process of getting equal pay. And uh, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a moment to brag just here, if I can, because the, the, uh, this film is being made by two of the graduates from our Take the Lead, 50 Women Can Change the World in Media and Entertainment. And in fact, that's where they met. That's where Rachel Feldman and Gioti Sarda met. And those are the, the key people who are making this film. So I am very excited about it. And can you tell us, tell people what's coming with that film? How did that happen? And when is it going to be out? And when can we see it? And all that. They've, they have not given me the update on when it'll be out yet. It was supposed to have been uh, later spring, but I'm not sure they're that far ahead right now but uh it's coming probably early fall would be my guess on the when it's out but it, it's really exciting and that was my goal from day one if it if it could just the story can just stay uh i wrote the book and the people that i contracted with to write the book they wanted more of how i grew up and what was my background and what gave me the stamina to go through what I had gone through and the flack I had taken from other people and the company that I worked for. And um, it didn't turn out exactly. I wanted it to start with the Goodyear time and or maybe a little mm -hmm. background and then work on it. I wanted it, I wanted to tell the story in that book and I didn't quite get to, but now the movie will pretty well do that. The script in the movie is pretty well going to tell the story. And if it doesn't get all the facts, there'll be a documentary that'll follow that. Oh. And uh, so it'll, it will, uh, uh, I want it left because the Ledbetter story is just everybody's story. It belongs to, it touches everybody in this country. One way or the mm -hmm. other, anyone you talk to has been touched by unequal pay for equal work somewhere. And it goes right. on for the rest of your life. It's not just what you work and earn today, but it's all of your life. It goes on into retirement. And, re and also your 
raises are generally percentages of what you start out. So you have right. to be sure you get the exact pay you should in the very beginning. Otherwise, you've lost, and there's not, nothing, no way you can get it back. Um, two, the thing that I'm the proudest of, the Ledbetter Bill was sponsored and co-sponsored by Republicans and Democrats. In fact, Olympia Snow was standing behind me when President Obama <laughs> signed that, and she's a Republican. Senator Collins supported it. And in fact, Olympia Snow said that that was the greatest moment of all of her years. In, wow. In, uh, the, wow. That's amazing. Like, That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I, we, we all yearn for the days when we could have that kind of bipartisan support of important legislation like this. That is for sure. And we well, in 18 months, 18 months. That's a record. I don't months. know anything has been biased in 18 months. <laughs> it has any teeth to it. Double congratulations on that. So, so, yeah. I, so what's 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 really uh, I think what's really striking me here is that we have we women or whoever, and I and I say this because we know there are many disparities among women in equal pay. We know that that white women make closer to equality in pay, that, that black women don't have an equal pay day until I think they make 62 cents to men's dollar. And for Latinas, it's way down further into the year, like um, into the fall before they are earning what the men earned in a comparable way. So we have so much more work yet to do to make sure that everyone is getting equal pay. But I do believe that we have the power we have the power to make change. And you two are examples of two different ways that we can utilize that power. Lily, you 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 use public policy and and Cindy, you use company policy. And if we can take just a few minutes here before we wrap up, I would love to know if you have some either of you have tips for individual women who who are trying to figure out how they can do something for themselves to to know their value and negotiate to get paid what they're worth. You know, if they're not going to be able to get legislation or they're not planning to do a lawsuit and they don't work for a company where they can feel like they can do what Cindy did, what are some things that individual women can do to know their value and negotiate and get paid what they're worth? Either of you have some tips? I do. Oh, I'll start if, if it's okay. okay. Yep. Oh. <clears throat> Learn. You, I encourage the young people to uh, younger women that be looking for that's going into a career to uh, learn how to negotiate their pay. Do the research. Do the homework. What does that company pay? What do people say about them? Do they have good benefits to get into the right job and to get the right money? That's what you really need. And once you get hired, look around in the company. Like Cindy had a kind of a coal coal conspirator or mentor type <laughs> person to listen to her and help her. You need a mentor, but you need to know you've got someone you can trust. Not all people in a company and corporation you can trust. <laughs> right, Cindy? But yeah. if you've got one, kind of team up and use them, but try to stay educated and follow the rules and follow the laws. And also what happened to me, I didn't get the Ledbetter bill passed all by myself, but when that verdict mm -hmm. hit the news media in May of 07, the lawyer said, literally, don't worry about the media, we'll handle it. And I thought, this is, I had a good case. I should have won. The law is on my side. I had a good attorney. I have nothing to be embarrassed about. And so I, NBC called, I said, come on up to 1206. CNN call, I invited them back. And then Norman Lear's group out of Washington call. I said, come on down, we'll do some film. And I did everything I could and everybody jumped on because from coast to coast, north to south, people was just upset. Men, lawyers, everybody. I got more support locally from retired professors from the college than I did women. The women didn't want to talk about it. It was embarrassing to let people know they didn't make what they should have. But the men jumped on and they got it. And that's what bombarded the Ledbetter bill. That's what got me tickets to the Washington, 
and put me in a hotel because I couldn't afford it. My husband was dying with cancer at the time. Mm -hmm. Gas was $5 a gallon in 2008. And we didn't have any money for me to be going back and forth to Washington. So other people footed that bill so I could do it. But I felt that... that and I sung that song about equal pay and why people needed it. And a lot of those young men in those offices talked about with tears running down their face, how their mm -hmm. mother worked two jobs mm -hmm. to get them to law school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this country, that's, wow. how you, that's yeah. how you get it done. You get the whole country behind you one way or the other. And if it's a cause like what sending them did, I mean, I hear Salesforce, I can't talk about them much anymore because everybody else has jumped on the wagon. <laughs> but that's <laughs> great because other corporations are going to say, hey, we need to look at this. So, so Lily, you used your megaphone. You used your mega, you used the power yeah. of your voice. I mean, this is, and here's something I think another lesson for all of us, which is that we all have the power of our own voice. We all mm -hmm. have the power of our own voice, and and that is something that that we definitely have, and we can use, and we should use. And I, I want to just say, I just put into the chat. I put a, a, a website where people can get good information, a comparable information about the compensation for the particular jobs that they have. So you can do your own research and start to understand and value, find out what your value is, what value you bring to the table. So that when you're asking for equal pay, you are basing it on data. You're, you're not just saying I'm doing a good job and I, I want to be paid more. I also right. put into the, the chat, the name of an organization called She Negotiates, SheNegotiates.com. Uh, the uh, my dear friend Victoria Pinchon is as saying that she's retiring. I don't believe it, but she says she's retiring. But she's turned her website, which was formerly her company, where she did consulting for women to help them get equal pay or get get the best compensation package they could. But you can still go to SheNegotiates.com, and there's just a ton of free resources about negotiating and material and information and referrals for some other really great negotiation mm -hmm. coaches or consultants. So I wanted to put those into the chat. If people are getting all hot under the collar and want to do something, this is how you can do it. You, there's just so much information out there now. So I, I, want to, I want to wrap this up with a final question that I always like to ask my guests, which is, what is your leadership lesson for women that you would like to share today from your experience or, or from what you're observing? What leadership lesson would you like to share? Lily, you want to go first? I will. Um, I have something I live by that, that I think is my leadership benefit. Um, I, I believe in what's right. It's right. You can't change it. That's the way it is. And if it's the right thing, it'll work out. And you've got to stand up for yourself and you never give up hope. You keep faith because, Lordy, it's been a long years now of this, getting this movie started. I've been wishing and hoping, <laughs> but I have a strong faith and I have hope. And you never, never give up. You, you yeah. throw your head back and your shoulders squared and you go forward because you cannot give up. Keep the faith and go forward. And I did Keep learn something that reiterated um, about life, too. It's not so much what happens to us, but what do we do about it? Mm -hmm. Do we get knocked mm -hmm. down? Do we get up? So forth. That's I believe in that. So I believe right. in staying true to myself and to others. Outstanding. Cindy, what's your leadership lesson that you want women to know? Well, I just, if I reflect on my own career, my own trajectory, um, it's, it is about doing your job and doing your job effectively, but at the same time, it's how you go about doing it and the relationships that you've built inside, um, I think really help propel me forward and upwards. And, um, a lot of that was just, I got a lot of advice from mentors and a lot of my advocates just stay true to who you are. Don't try to be someone else. Just stay true to being your authentic self. And I know there's a lot of articles and books written about being your authentic self, but I really had to say that to myself on multiple times because it's very easy to steer away from that or get influenced to do so. But I do feel to Lily's point, like your authentic self will lead you to do the right thing. 
And in the end, Beautiful. no matter what happens, you know, if I can go to sleep at night feeling good about doing the right thing, um, that that's a win for me. Well, so both both of you, you've 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 each said somewhat the same thing in different words, and it helps me understand why you are the leaders that you are and why you've been able to accomplish what you've been doing. And I want to again thank you on behalf of all women for doing all of that. And um, as we as we close out, I just want to remind people that we're streaming this on on Twitter, Facebook, and and LinkedIn. And then afterwards, we'll also post it on other media. So please, there's so much valuable advice that you've heard here and so many great stories about how we can make a difference for equal pay. The, share this around. Make sure that your friends and colleagues know about it because you may help the next woman to get paid what she deserves. And that is a big, big, big deal. So uh, I, I also will say that as uh, we have, we have uh, revised and updated and made even better than it ever was, even though it was already called life-changing and jet fuel for my career, our Take the Lead Nine Leadership Power Tools to Advance Your Career online course is up for, for uh, enrollment again. So, and this week through the end of March, which is in honor of Women's History Month, you can get $100 off of any one of the different versions of the course that you choose to take with the code WHM22, WHM, Women's Health, uh, Women's, sorry, Women's History Month 22. And uh, you can choose to take the course as a self-study course. You can take it and get four masterminds with me. You can also take it and get the masterminds and the course and coaching, whatever serves you and your needs the best. So you can go to taketheleadwomen.com forward slash online course, taketheleadwomen.com forward slash online course. And you can find out more about it there. And I, I would love for you to join me in this course. I, I love working with the women who take this course. So I thank you all for being here. I particularly thank you, Lily, and you, Cindy, for being here, for the work you've done. I'll see all of you next week, I hope, when my guest will be the amazing Minda Hartz, author of The Memo and Write Within, books that are changing how Black women work and show how workplaces should be treating Black women. Well, actually, everybody. And she has a new young adult book book coming out April 5th. It's called You Are More Than Magic. So it sounds really great. We will get a chance to talk with her about that and you'll be the first to know about her new book. So till then, thank you so much for being with us and keep intentioning. <laughs>